welcome to another episode of Let's Look At It Again. We continue our talks with Brother Zahir of Community Movement Builders in Atlanta, Georgia. We'll talk about his work toward what it means to be defined as an African. And we'll also discuss what we have determined to be the African Family Imperatives, a list of things we need to do toward our liberation. Brother Zahir, we've talked a little bit over the last few weeks or so about this project that you're working on. You're writing a book, and I would like for you to tell our listeners what the topic is and what inspired you to do this work. Great question. Uh, so the title of the book, Becoming African, Radical Transformation, Revolutionary Catchism, and the Art of Maguzi. What really, truly inspired me to write this book was my getting involved with the movements and seeing all of the different perspectives and factors that make up all of these different radical Black movements. And what I saw was there was a lot of ideas around change, transformation, right? Uh, an external transformation, changing capitalism and socialism, internal transformations and becoming African. But there wasn't one that stated it in a very detailed manner of what it means to transform and what it means to be African and what it means to be revolutionary. And we put those together. What does it mean to be an African revolutionary? And why is it important to transform? And what are the steps in this transformation process? That was my uh, biggest motivation for writing this because I felt like the transformation process was just as important. The internal transformation is just as important, if not more important, than the external transformation. So without the consciousness first, right, it's going to be a lot harder <laughs> to be dedicated to the struggle, right, and, and to transform the external world if you can't transform your internal world. Absolutely. What are some of your greatest motivations for your writing or in your writing? And what I mean is what authors, what other organizations, what um, historical narratives are um, an inspiration or motivation to you? Malcolm X is uh, one of my biggest inspirations, especially for this book. Maalana Karenga, his works on uh, transformation. Dr. John Hendrick Clark, Kwame Ture, Khalid Abdul Muhammad, community movement builders, All African People's Revolutionary Party, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. It's things that affected me personally from when I first became conscious at 16 to being in the military, getting out to joining the movements. All of those characters and organizations uh, inspired me in some kind of way and continues to inspire me to this day. And it shapes my opinion and outlook. And so I put all of those experiences and I think about those ancestors every time I write. And really, I feel like they really flow through me, their spirit. And that's what really motivates me to continue to write down. Because when I see uh, the problem, I'm a, I'm, I'm a very big thinker and I like to analyze and break down problems. And so my main objective all the time it's not just to add to a lot of the intellectual things that are going on, but I really wanna pinpoint a problem and solve it for the next generation. I really wanna look at a good point that you brought up in regards to transformation. Um, actually, that was one of the things that um, putting into this document and the Elder and I were just talking about as well, is the fact that we focused so much of our attention on uh, wanting to change the system, wanting to argue against white supremacy, anti-capitalism, but there's not a, enough focus centered on personal development and transformation toward recla reclaiming African identity or Africanness. Yeah, and and you know, Malcolm X called, I believe, for a cultural revolution amongst Black people. You know, and that's one of the things that have been sidetracked. And I, I believe part of the reason why it's been sidetracked is because um, 
when white folks kind of got involved in the movements through the Marxism and, and sort of the social groups, I believe they wanted to take it out of the nationalism and focus it just specifically on class. And although there's some concepts of transformation within Marxism, right? It doesn't specifically talk about the African identity, which was again, part of the influences uh, of why I wrote my book, because I noticed even uh, the socialists didn't really have a real program that said, this is what it meant to be a socialist. This is what it means when you identify. Right? And I think that's pro part of what meant, part of what attracted Malcolm to the NOI, you know, uh, the self-improvement program, you know, and it, it, the transformation he went through, through Islam, whether we like, you know, that version of Islam or not, it helped him become a better person, which disciplined him and helped fashion him to become a better revolutionary, you know? And so that, you know, I, I learned this also from my talks from an elder from the community. His name is Dr. Kelsey, he's 95. And these are some of the conversations that I built with him, built on with him because he was saying, you know, we lose so much when we're not able to transfer our culture to one another, you know? And if we can't teach one another how to, how to love ourselves, right? Because if you love yourself, then you ain't gonna let anybody disrespect you, right? And you're gonna fight for yourself. You're gonna um, wanna provide for yourself. If you truly love yourself, and you ain't gonna look for anybody outside of yourself to make it happen, except for the other loved ones. But you know, we got that problem of that Stockholm syndrome. We think our enemy loves us. So yeah, so you know, the a proper education in African consciousness is so important. Uh, and there was so many mistakes made because of the lack of transformation, because of the lack of, of cultural uh, awareness right they made a lot of mistakes and a lot of the elders told me that you know and and they told me that personally there was a lot of mistakes and, and they said cointel pro yeah it was bad but a lot of it was just simple gossip simple instigating you know and people were involved in a lot of just bad behavior uh, that could have been handled in another principal way if we had uh the african identity or consciousness to help us through that if we don't get along it's okay because we're not getting along based on us not having the same principles. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. I definitely agree. Uh, our energies, man, you know, that's important. And we don't want to waste our energy and our time on people that is toxic or at least, and they don't even have to be toxic, but it's like, you want to just make sure y'all moving in the same direction. Cause man, you know, it takes a lot of time to build, you know, and then wanting to do something, it, it doesn't need to try to go in so many different directions, you know. Especially, you know, being a part of an organization, you know, because uh, a lot of times we'll, you know, we'll have study groups, we'll have lecture series, we'll have, you know, online discussions, but, you know, even myself, you know, I have to admit, I don't belong to an organization. So what I'm doing is minute compared to what you're doing because you actually committed your time and your energy to work with an organization and do the necessary developing within yourself in order to impact the, the uh, organization, which impacts the community. So, you know, I commend that. And, you know, that's something that I am working on, working toward. Um, and that's a whole nother topic. We, we tend to try to create or build things, you know, when we could just lend our support to what someone else is doing. Right. All, and, and anything helps, <laughs> you know. But the basic premise of this work, um, I'm pointing out from the University of Kemet Press is, uh, starting out with the process of redemption, um, you know, cutting away all of the negative things that make us who we are as a colonized people in this country, you know, clearing out all of the bad, all of the negative habits and tendencies, uh, 
doing away with you know the uh, the the tainted consciousness that we have in order for us to begin a reawakening process, a cleansing process. With your book, if you don't mind, can you share some of the, uh, let's just kind of go over some of the topics, if you wish, you know, some of the topics that are of most important in that piece of work. Okay. Um, I definitely have um, the central thesis of the book, um, which is transformation. And I get that from Violana Karenga. And for those who want to look this up, it's called The Liberation Ethics of Malcolm X. And point number two of The Liberation Ethics of Malcolm X is um, to live in the truth of the recovered and reconstructed self, right? And so I took that ethic to mean we have to recover, which means Sankofa, go back to Africa. And like I said, that's the internal transformation process. And that's just like what you just shared because we have to rid ourselves, right? Of this negativity, this decolonization process, you know, this is, it, it's very important because we have to really dig inside ourselves and find out the ways that we're still attached, right? Whether it's even in individualism, it's a hard thing. You got to really challenge yourself and look at yourself and say, am I being this, you know, and how can I go against that or how can I change that, you know, and it's not just something negative in a sense of drug addiction, right, or uh, going to prison, although those are big things that happen in our communities as well, but it's also just looking at the ways of, you know, recovering and reconstruction, right, so he said the recovery and reconstruct itself reconstruct what it means to be African. And in my book, I go into saying, number one, it's participation, right? Because for the African communities, it's your particip participation in the community that matters. That's what makes it a community, you know? You can be born into it, but to really put yourself there and give yourself to this community is very important. So. One of these things that I say makes the African and makes the revolution is that participation in the struggle and the participation in um, adopting what I go on to the Nguzu Sabo, which is the values and the six African virtues, uh, which is reverence, self-control, thoughtfulness, courage, diligence in work and communalism. And once you pick up those virtues, you use those virtues to help you continue to uh, go through this recovery, recovering yourself from Western capitalist, white supremacy ways, understand the ways in which maybe you uh, participate in those bad behaviors, right? And then transform yourself by using those six African virtues into being an um, African revolutionary. And so it's through those things, it's that process. And I call this process personhood. This is what it means to be a person in our community. It's to always transform and make yourself better, more valuable, uh, more dedicated, more disciplined, and more committed uh, to your people's liberation struggle. And that's actually repeated as the third um, ethic in Malcolm X's liberation ethics. In your mind, what is the end goal you know, through the work that you're doing, uh, giving to the people, you know, you're synthesizing the work of Malcolm X, some of the work of Malawana Karenga, what is the ultimate end goal or objective in this transformation process? My end goal is to standardize what it means to be African, uh, what it means to be an African revolutionary. And what I mean by that is if the people can adopt the culture where we have certain marriage rights, we have certain naming ceremonies. We all know that we're gonna read this from Maalana Karenga, or we're gonna read this from Kwame Nkrumah. If we have this standard, right? To me, it's going to push the consciousness forward because now we have a set standard or what we all, and it stops a lot of this 
bickering and fighting amongst each other, right? It stops a lot of these differences from happening and it becomes more of a culture because if our sons and daughters can go through the same kind of rites of passage program, identify with the same virtues, identify with the same principles, so they should identify with the same mission, even become adults and may leave the house. They still have the identity of what it means to be African. And it's to ultimately be our own liberators. That's one of the principles I write in there, being we are our own, right? Because we know no one else is going to solve these problems in our community, right? And what I see a lot of times is a lack of confidence, especially in the youth. And there's not a lot of programs, or it's, it's not even programs, but we don't control the media that comes to television. And so, and we don't control the education, the, the ed type of education we're getting through their institutions. And so nobody's really teaching what it means to be Black or what it means to be African. So everybody's trying to figure it out. I take a definition of what it means to be African from Steve Biko. And he said, you know, Black is not just a pigmentation, it's a mental attitude. So I tell him African isn't just a, a pigmentation, right? It's an it's a attitude that you want the liberation for your people. And not just an equality, right? Not just it's taking it past the integration phase, right? But it's now it's giving you a standard, it's giving you an identity, and it's saying this is who we are. Achieve that greatness. So that's my end goal is to get us on this same page and have a strong group that we can recognize each other you're African, you're African, and we can work together. So that way, if I go to, to where you're at, you come to where I'm at, we may not be in the same organization, but I know if you're African and you know that I'm African, we have the exact same mission state. And we can say, oh, we know we're supposed to form a rites of passage program, or we know we're supposed to be building counter institutions. You know, So that is my end goal and my end state to write in this book. I appreciate it. That's powerful. And uh, I'm right in line with you. And, you know, that will be a perfect segue from your mission there and your end goal to what I'm working on. And hopefully we can get together and complete this, you know, with your book, with my my writings. I'm not writing a book, but I'm working on a paper, an essay, which I'm titling The Black African Family Imperative. And it's centered around a list of ideals that I believe we should hold as Africans. And I'm going to read over them. And I want you to give me your thoughts in the end. Uh, so far, it's about 12 or 13 points. Number one, claim an African family name. And of course, this is for African families. So it says claim an African family name. I believe that all African people should embrace a African name from somewhere, some culture, some ethnicity, some language group on the continent and do the necessary work to legally change who you are, get rid of the name of the colonizer. Number two, claim an African tradition, something that is rooted in spirituality. Doesn't matter what it is, just claim and begin to practice something and rejecting European and Arab religions. Number three, educate your children. If you are an African or you call yourself a revolutionary, uh, there's no reason why you should not have an African educational system uh, or at, at minimum homeschool or you know join a black African collective where you are educating your children along your own self-determined uh, educational program. Number four, practice anti-capitalism. I think as an African principle, anti-capitalism should be something that we should understand, whether we uh, learn it, you know, through our own study, or we, you know, come in contact with groups who offer study of anti-capitalism and what we should do to replace it. Number five, release debt. We should do the best that we can to struggle to get out of debt and to stay out of debt. Number six, reject all non-African cultural activities 
including holidays. As African people, we should reject and not participate in any of these Eurocentric holidays. If it's not an African holiday with cultural or traditional ties to a land or a people, we should not participate in them. Number seven, practice collective and cooperative sharing. And I made a very important point, not to say business, but just collective and cooperative sharing, where we are not working at exploiting, using, or benefiting from one another for gain, but actually sharing resources, ideas, and commitments with one another. Number eight, take care of your health, your mental health, your physical health. Most importantly, your diet. Give up a lot of the Eurocentric and Western ideals toward food. For example, I used to love pizza and I had to give it up. Why? Because it's anti-African. Number nine, reconnect to Africa physically. If you can, take the necessary steps to visit the continent and spend time with African people. If you can't, or you're not able to at the moment, you should at least socially, historically, try and reintegrate your life with African language, culture, customs, and most importantly, African past. Number 10, work hard, but don't compromise your Africanness or your integrity to make an income. This is important. We tend to work high paying jobs where we cannot identify with our Africanists. We have to uh, toe the line, so to speak, in order to maintain our positions within corporations and government. We should remove ourselves from situations like that. Uh, readjust your finances, downsize if necessary, in order to have a uh, lifestyle that will allow you a little bit of freedom I guess, quote unquote, a little bit of freedom to express who you are as an African. Number 11, produce something beneficial to African people, whether it's writing, videos, lectures, products that you develop. There should be something that we produce for African people that will help to uplift us and move us forward. And last one, number 12, reject luxury you know, by that i mean give up luxury designer brand clothing uh give up our lust and our attraction to excess you know wanting to buy and consume so many things for a status you know enjoying spending evenings out eating at fancy restaurants or anything that's just frivolous and uh connected to western Eurocentric luxury. I think we need to remove those things from our lives. Uh, and that's it, brother. What do what do you think of that list? I think the list uh, the list is a, is amazing. You know, um, what you were talking about with uh, the kind of cooperative economics that stood out to me because those are things I've read about before. Like they have these alternative ideas around sharing economy, gift economy. You know, and what that does is that get you out of the mindset that an economy just means profit or growth or development that you know you're only thinking of economics in this capitalist growth kind of way and that way and what that also does is it starts to get us in a mindset where we have our own economic base which is establishing our own cultural practices within that economic base right so rejecting luxury that's why i talk about with the liberated zone our wall street doesn't have to look like their wall street if our wall street is taking care of the basic needs of the people you know and if if if, if we're comfortable with what we have and we have each other that's what we need to get to and that's what it is to be african right um work hard but don't compromise yourself that was something that stood out to me too because i left the military in order to be my African self. So that definitely stood out. And I know everybody's not gonna make that same sacrifice, but you know, it was worth it. It was worth me following that passion. Yeah, 
Uh, of course, you know, I like the, the, the reject the non-African holidays. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I created that holiday list. Absolutely. Produce something beneficial. Because that reminds me of my, uh, my favorite uh, Nguzu Saba principle, which is uh, Kaumba, to do always as much as we can and we can, to leave our communities more beautiful and beneficial to which we inherited it. So that to me stood out because it's telling you to do something, produce something, do it as best as you can in a way that you can. It, you don't have to, everybody want to be Malcolm, everybody might not be able to be Malcolm. Be you for the revolution or be you for your people. Be you, be African in the way that you can be African, you know? We all have important contributions to make, um, you know, with, with your writing, you know, you producing these writings, the book that you're working on, it's going to be a major contribution. When do you project that it will be ready for the public? I project uh, it will be ready at the end of this year, around uh, Kwanzaa. <laughs> and we'll make sure I try to get it out towards the end of this year. Now, is this the uh, master's thesis that you're working on or just a personal project? It's a personal project um, that I decided to uh, research and put together. And that will be your contribution to Black African family, community, and nationhood. And again, I look forward to it. I support it from everything that you shared so far will help move us forward. And that's what we need. Uh, young, fresh minds like yours that are trying to move us forward, you know, unapologetically, without ego, without fanfare, and doing the necessary work in the community. So I commend you, brother. And if I could help in any way. Yeah, I was going to say thank you for your uh, African contributions here just through YouTube. This is one of our virtues that I wrote about called reverence, you know, and that's just to pay respect to our, our, our people, each other, you know, we show respects and contribute. So thank you for your work, uh, putting this on YouTube as well.